I just feel really excited to be here with all these wonderful leaders. And there's so many people that I've worked with over the years out there. Um, so thanks to all you guys for coming along. Um, so um, I guess just I'll give you a little bit of a picture about me and what I do. Um, and then my ideas and thoughts about inclusion, um, true inclusion, and then just a few examples from the work that I do here in Mildura. Um, if you've got some questions, just chuck them in the chat. And um, if I have time, I'll try and, and answer those. Or if I don't, I'll make sure I get back to you another time. So I was very lucky to start my life in community musician as a very small person living in southwestern Sydney in the 1980s, where we had a community composer employed by the council. Amazing days. Um, John Shortis, if any of you have come across the amazing um, ACT-based um, composer. And um, I was in a children's circus, uh, community orchestra, all sorts of things with my dad, who I now know could hardly play a note, but at the time I thought he was wonderful. So very lucky start to my community music life. And um, I guess I was always immersed in um, full inclusion um, right from the get-go. So um, as uh, Strat said, I've, I've been working in this Field for about 25 years um, and I've worked in, in um, Gippsland, in Melbourne, in um, the Northern Territory and I've been in Mildura for the last um, almost seven years. Um, and what I do here, I'm a music therapist, um, also a music teacher and um, special educator and community musician. Um, I should acknowledge that um, I lived in the Dandenong Rangers for five years um, and a lot of what I know about community music, I learned from the wonderful Jeannie Marsh and Beth McAllister. So I really want to acknowledge um, their amazing contribution to community music in Victoria. I know Bev's not here today, but Jeannie's here. Um, so right now, what am I doing? Um, I run a business called Sunraiser Arts and Learning. Right from the get-go, my vision was that our business would somehow um, make music making um, accessible to anyone and everyone in our community, quality music making available. Um, and so what has this led to? Um, I've got a lovely team that work with me, which is amazing. Um, but some of the on the ground stuff that I'm doing is I'm involved with the With One Voice Mildura Choir. Um, I'm working, doing lots of intergenerational work in nursing homes. Um, we run an early childhood music program. We're working in lots of Indigenous playgroups, um, providing music making. Um, we're currently using some COVID funding, which um, amazing Jill, who's here from the council today, the council have um, given us some money to push out a um, program called the Mali Active Arts Roadshow. Um, so we're taking this general community music making workshops across the whole of our shire. Our shire is quite large, and so um, we're getting out sort of to the outer reaches of Murrayville and um, Oyen and Underbull and the Mallee Track to Nangelock to Werramal and um, running um, COVID recovery music workshops. So that's a little bit about me and what I'm doing. What I want to do now, though, is just give you two big ideas um, about inclusion in community music. Um, so I've got yeah, two really big ideas. When I sat down to think about what it is that I do, I sat down and thought, well, there's two really big aspects to my understanding of inclusion and then how I think I do that. Um, so what does inclusion look like? So just before I start those two big ideas, high quality music making opportunities everywhere for anyone of any age. So it's not just about large print music and wheelchair access. True inclusion and accessibility moves well beyond that. It's about everybody everywhere who wants to make music being able to make music in some way. It's about creating a sense of belonging and welcome to everyone, regardless of barriers, both seen and unseen. And thank you to Nikki from when I was throwing her brainstorming thoughts for um, helping me word that up. It's fostering self-belief and confidence in every person that they can participate in music making. And it's about celebrating music participation in its broadest sense rather than understanding music participation in a narrow way, like just playing a song or a piece. I feel like it's my job to celebrate and make explicit the courage and commitment it takes to participate at any stage of music making. And I feel also that it's my role to provide invitations to participate at any stage and explicit positive feedback to everyone who participates. Thank you so much to um, coming to listen to our music today. We loved having you here. So I see music participation really broadly, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about now. Oh, yes, Jess, um, I did talk to Nikki about that. I'll tidy up my notes and I'll send them out, um, no problem at all. 
Oh, thanks, Nikki. She's on it. <laughs> Super fast. All right. So my two big themes. What is music participation? What does it look like? So I am observing, and I guess that's thanks to, thanks to my music therapy training, massive part of my school, school toolkit is observing. I observe always and everywhere, looking for and drawing out music participation at any stage of the continuum. So what does music participation look like? What am I looking for? So the first, and, and I think I need to preface this by saying that I'm not just talking about music participation in community music settings. I'm talking about in people's houses, on the street, in the supermarket, at school, at the kinder, at the playgroup. Um, I'm talking about absolutely everywhere. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about music making right where it starts in the home. Um, music participation in, and community music making in a very broad sense. So... The, I've, I've got a kind of continuum, um, which again, I'll send out to you. What does music participation look like? Being present, just being in a space where music making is going on in the communities, organisations and at home. And um, we do, we run a program here called Music Together um, and it's for zero to fives and family members. It's an early childhood music program. Those babies are often present. And I see that as music participation and I make that explicit in my sessions. Wow, so-and-so is here listening to that music. It's so important for them hearing you sing, mum, dad, nana, auntie. That baby is present. They're already participating. People who come and listen to someone jamming in the street, they're already participating. And I try and draw that out and make it explicit. So people are participating at many levels. The next stage, listening, watching or observing, choosing to observe music making. Again, in the community, organisations at home, sometimes singing and playing on the inside. We have a lot of people who come to our With One Voice um, Mildura Choir to listen. And I try to acknowledge that as music participation. Thank you so much for coming to listen. It really supports us in our music making. I hope that you've really enjoyed joining in by listening today. Or in, in um, when I'm working with um, people with disability and I've learned to observe what, what listening looks like. Don't stress, I'll say to the support worker, so-and-so doesn't need to bang that drum. Relax, they're listening. Listening is a massive part of music participation. And we all know that music and listening is an incredibly important thing to do when you're trying to um, learn music. So that I, I try to really um, celebrate uh, what might look like passive music making, but to me, that's active music making. Making sound and moving is the next stage. Any sound, any movement, any volume, any size, any duration, even if it's not intentional. So my job is to find a way to draw attention to the musical elements of the sound or the movement that someone's making. And I see this particularly in my work with people with profound disability. Someone might make a non-purposeful um, sound which may or may not be heard as music. I hear that as music. I see that as music participation. And I try and find a way to draw that out and celebrate that. The next stage I see is making purposeful sound or purposeful movement, choosing to make music with your body. Again, at home, in the community, at school, in the supermarket. My daughters don't like it when I do it in the supermarket, but, you know, <laughs> such is preteen life. Um, so that, again, I celebrate that. So, I mean, we have a lot of members in our choir who, when they join, um, may never have used their singing voice or have not, you know, it might not be something that they feel really powerful or, or confident at. And I really try really hard to celebrate every stage of that. Thank you so much for joining us with your voice today. It's so great having everyone's voices here. Making purposeful sound and movement with others. So taking the leap to joining in with a group, no matter what you contribute. And so I've run um, a choirs in special schools for, for 20 years and um, I really um, try to celebrate and, and also embrace and then support other people to accept that someone may not be singing the same words as we're singing or someone might not be singing exactly at the same time, but this is their way of contributing. Then I've got it moving into tuneful and rhythmic sound. Um, and so, so many times, like a number of members of my um, choir with disability um, might be singing along in tune but not quite managing the words and kind of doodling along and again we celebrate that and then moving into making tuneful and rhythmic sounds with others. 
To me, this is all music participation. And I, I really don't, never want to forget the people who are supporting music making. So they kind of go all alongside my continuum. They might never sing or play a note, but they work away making sure other people can participate. So to me, they're part of the music participation continuum because without them, things would often stop. So that's, that's a my picture of music participation. And I think our role as music, community music leaders or, or, or music leaders in your own home is sometimes just to recognise um, someone's music participation at whatever level that is, the baby kicking their legs when they listen to music or the, the um, you know, person singing as they walk down the street or when I run community workshops at, at festivals, you know, the, the, the people that creep up and just kind of tap behind me. I really try to, um, I really try to make sure that I celebrate that and make that um, explicit. So that's probably, that's my first big, first big um, rule, principle, thing that I, that I live by. The second idea is that um, leadership and um, true inclusion, that true inclusion is rich and wonderful, but it is almost always extremely messy. Um, we all know that life is really messy and this is even messier, I would argue, <laughs> in some cases. True inclusion, it's our, and it's our role to lead through that in an honest, real way and bring those challenges out into the open. So people come to community music, and I, in this case I'm talking explicitly, um, of course I'm talking across community, across organisations, but in this case I'm talking explicitly about people coming to a to group to make music. <laughs> Messy and demanding, absolutely, um, Gary. <laughs> um, because being accepting of people's levels of music participation doesn't mean that, that um, you know, I'm going to just stand in the room with lots of people hoodling and say that's okay. We're still working together, for example, in my choir to try and make a joined up sound, but not judging on our journey to that is probably the important thing. So um, that's, um, yes, thank you, Lyndall, non-judgmental <laughs> celebration. Uh, but it really is, um, it's messy. So it's really being able to live with the messiness that sometimes a session will be really hard or, or the conversations you have with people coming to your group can be really hard um, because inclusion, true inclusion is hard because it challenges people. It challenges people to look at their own, um, what they might be judging or their own um, barriers or their own obstacles. It, it, it challenges people to look at how, what they expect might be different to what somebody else expects. Um, and people coming along to community music groups come with an incredibly diverse set of expectations and hopes. So again, I feel like it's my role to draw these out and make a space where people can talk and journey through the inevitable bumps when people's expectations are different. And this happens all the time in all of the places I work in and, and make music in. So I see this as a combination of creating a space where all stages of music participation are recognised and celebrated, recognised and celebrated, and sometimes just the messiness of them being celebrated. Gosh, it was hard to sing because so-and-so was clapping because that's what they need to do, but so-and-so over here is, is hard of hearing. This is hard, but didn't it sound great anyway? So that's really my job is to make sure it's all out there and it's all direct. Um, I try to be clear about what I hope for as a leader, so musically and socially. I really hope we can sing this piece in three parts, but it might take us a while because some of us are still learning to sing in unison. That's okay. That's our journey as a, as a music making group. I explicitly talk about the challenges of inclusion as much as I can in an open, honest way. So it might be one-to-one -to, -one to people. It might be a comment I make the whole group when we are faced with a challenge face-to-face. -face. Um, I think the biggest part of this is um, being prepared to introduce and try out practical ways to make sure that different ways of participation and not excluding. So for example, in our choir, there are a number of um, members who, who find it hard to, to hear, um, who are harder of hearing either because of ageing or um, whatever other reason you might have for finding. But I also have a number of members um, who really love to dance and clap and um, while they're, they're learning um, songs. And so I try to make, I try a few, like quite a few things and, and I've, encourage the choir to come up with creative solutions for this. You know, maybe so-and-so could move over here and that would help you hear. 
maybe we can find another way to move our body that doesn't make sound. Always trying to acknowledge that also the impact of those kinds of crashes. Um, no, really it is, I love that you're dancing, but maybe if you dance over here, it will um, help so-and-so be able to hear. Um, so I try and couple like high expectations physically with the celebration of everyone's journey. Um, the other thing is choosing repertoire. I try to choose repertoire that has multiple entry points. And again, that's um, a really tricky journey. I really want to challenge people that want to learn, um, to want to learn who, you know, challenging repertoire, singing in three and four parts. But I also know that there's people coming in who, who might feel challenged by that. And so choosing um, repertoire where you can feel successful at lots of levels. I think the other thing that's really key about my approach to all of this is trying to keep a sense of humour. And so there'll be days at the end of choir or, or my music together classes or Indigenous playgroup where, you know, we've had like six kids just belting around the room while, you know, there's been a couple of mums and me on the floor is being able to just have a laugh about how messy it is and how music making is often messy. Um, yeah, so I know I'm going to run out of time. So I just, um, I could talk for hours about this, but I just want to really encourage you to to celebrate the messiness of the journey, um, but also to be quite practical. Okay, well, how are we going to, you know, be out there with it? How are we going to to help each other make the best of being here um, when sometimes people need to dance and sometimes people need to, to hear? Um, oh, great question, Belinda. Um, so a lot of our work has moved online in regional Victoria. Um, we, because of the group restriction sizes, even when we're out of lockdown, things like choir and um, playgroups and stuff either have to be reduced in size. So some of our programs had to reduce down to be under 10 people. So that's endless timetabling for me, of course. But choir has had to be online. But we had two very lucky sessions um, in the little window there between lockdown six and seven. Um, so yeah, great question, Belinda. I think I just want to leave you with this thought and this, I didn't get to say this in my, my um, breakout session, but this pandemic and my work um, in inclusion and diversity in community music has really left me with the fact that simple things are powerful. So all of what you're doing every day is, is increasing, the, you know, inclusion and diversity. Sharing music in a joyful way is an incredibly powerful thing that you do every day to support community connection inclusion. This pandemic has taught me that you can never undervalue how important it is just to share music with joy and how inclusive that is um, and how connecting that is for our community. So I think I just want to leave you with that because you're already doing it. This is called Singing Every Day. First section is the call and response. And then in the second section, there's lots of harmonies and I'll just sing all of them in a row and you add in whichever ones you like. So I'm sure you fabulous leaders we have to get those harmonies. It's nice and easy.
seeing you. They're dancing. Oh, right. That's beautiful. Woo, they're dancing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 